Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Can you turn me up a little? All right. Is that better? All right, kids. Denna Hess. Uh, raise your head, Denna. So I, I owe Denna a little something. Um, my wife, they have this thing they call me a T-Rex because I have short arms. So, um, but Denna has kind of joined in on that party. And I, I told her, Denna, you're aware that I have the mic every Sunday, right? However, I'm going to save that this week so you can live in fear a couple more weeks. But kids, follow Denna Hess here at the back. They're going to take you downstairs have a good time. It's coming, though, Denna. Uh, this morning, uh, Anna Leeser texted me, Dan's mother, Violet, um, had to be rushed to the hospital this morning. Um, she's 96, mother to, she's, she's had 10 children, um, and she, she's in ICU this morning, so she needs our prayer. Um, there are many others on our prayer list that we need to continue to faithfully pray for. We want to keep Carolyn Chittenden, Melissa, that whole family in our prayers after the loss of the, the patriarch Chuck of that family. Let's go to the Lord this morning. Father, you are so good, Lord. Your mercy, your grace that we don't deserve. Father, thank you for hearing our petitions, Lord. Thank you for answering prayer. Thank you for your presence this morning, your Holy Spirit. We love you, Lord. Today we do lift up Violet Leeser as she's in the hospital, Lord. We just pray your presence. Lord, we pray that you move in that hospital, that she may know that you are there, a faithful woman. Just love her, Lord. Lord, we pray that you work through the nurses and the doctors and the support staff. We pray for your will, Lord, and that you might be glorified. And I, just know that, I know that that's what she would pray as well. We do pray for Carolyn Chittenden, for Missy, for Craig, for the girls, and really for our church family after such a big loss. Lord, I'm just asking you to be close to them, Lord. Guide their steps. Draw their eyes, their hearts towards you. Father, we pray for all the mothers in our community this morning that don't know you, that are hurting, that are broken, that are struggling. Lord, we pray that they might experience your mercy and your grace, that you might use us as vessels for that. And that you might be glorified in our community, Lord. Father, we pray for your word this morning, not mine. For open hearts. And for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, before I get started, I do want to acknowledge something. Mother's Day is a special day. It's a day we celebrate mothers. It's also a day we just celebrate women in general. But it's, it's hard for some people. Some of you may have lost your mother. Some of you may have a, a tough relationship with your mother. Um, some of you might be mothers who are estranged from their children for whatever reason. And for some women who have desperately wanted children, that haven't been blessed with children, this is especially hard. I, I was reading something this week that said many, many women choose not even to come to church on Mother's Day because it's just painful. So we, we want to lift up those mothers this morning. We want to lift up those women this morning. But today is a day that we celebrate mothers. I don't really like holidays. I don't like preaching holidays. I mean, I, I like celebrating well, Amy, celebrating my mom, but I don't, I, I don't like to preach holidays. I want to just preach through the book of Acts. I want to just preach the word, what it says, but... And I, and I wrote a sermon from Acts 16 on Lydia 
as a celebration of a woman, of a saint that we could all admire. And I just felt like the Lord was, was calling me to something different. So I have a sermon for here in about four weeks when we get there. But this morning we are, we're going to celebrate mothers. Um, we're going to celebrate not only what they do, but who they are, the value they bring to our families, our churches. George Washington, the first president of the United States, said, all I am, all I owe to my mother. I attribute my success in life to the moral, intellectual, and physical education I received from her. Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, said, all that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. Charles Spurgeon, one of the most prolific preachers in all of history, said this, I cannot tell you how much I owe to the solemn word of my good mother. Mother's Day here in the U.S. can be traced back to a woman named Anna Jarvis, who began writing letters to senators, congressmen, and state governors in 1905, requesting that day be set aside, that a day be set aside to honor motherhood and mothers. She worked hard and she worked continuously and it paid off. By 1911, nearly every state had a, a state holiday celebrating and honoring mothers. Finally, in 1914, President Woodrow Wilson signed a joint resolution passed by Congress that designated the second Sunday in May as the national holiday we now know as Mother's Day. Now, 108 years later, I think my math is right, our culture has become confused, twisted. Many Americans don't value or don't understand the role of a mother. Instead of prominent leaders and people saying things like, I owe everything, to the teaching and training of my mother, you hear things like, the home is your prison. Free yourself from the drudgery of motherhood. I saw it on Twitter this, this week, even amongst clergymen, sadly. Um, and at the same time, women who see being a mother, as the Bible describes it, as an honor and as a privilege, they are marginalized and demonized by the general public. And our society today doesn't see being a mom as something that is valuable as a whole or of great importance. Now, the Bible, on the other hand, is completely the opposite. In fact, the Bible describes being a mother as one of the most important roles and callings in society. In, in, in fact, I'd argue that being a parent, a mother, or a father is the highest, most important role and calling given in the page, pages of Scripture. It's more important than being a, ki a king, a queen, or a leader. It's more important than being a pastor, a prophet, or a priest. It's more important than being a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, or a farmer. And it's more important than being in law enforcement or the military. Like I said, being a, a parent, a father, or a mother is the highest calling and role given in Scripture. So with that in mind, I want you to take your Bibles and open them to Titus 2, 1 to 5. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subjects to their husband so that no one will malign the word of God. Stay with me. Now the Apostle Paul, he's, here he's writing to a young pastor, and he's telling him, this is what you are to do. You are to teach, but not just any old thing. You are going to teach what accords or what lines up with Scripture, with sound doctrine. So here we have Paul, who is an experienced leader, preacher, church planter, church father, so on, instructing Titus, who is one of his protégés, and a young man. Paul's giving Titus advice on how to pastor a church as a young man. In the first chapter, he instructs them how to appoint elders, also how to squash foolishness in the church. Here he's, here he's telling him how to teach, realizing the nuances of pastoring a church and pastoring a church with, 
folks that are older than he is as a young man. Paul, Paul, that's not lost on Paul as he's writing this. So realizing those nuances, he gives them some very wise instruction here. Essentially, he's saying stick to the word. In other words, teach what lines up with Scripture, what affirms Scripture, what results from Scripture. Teach what Scripture teaches. And then basically, Paul gives examples of what he means. Verse 2, older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Just like, just like God did in creation, Paul starts with men here. Older men, he lays out what spiritual maturity looks like. To be sober-minded, to not be drunk, but to be sober, to be clear-minded and focused on the task at hand. To be self-controlled, to not be ruled by your sin nature, but to be ruled by the Spirit. This is spiritual maturity. To be sound in faith. Hear me, men. To be sound in faith. This is important. To be in love. To be motivated by love. Love for God. Love for our neighbor as ourself. And to be steadfast. To be steady. If Paul were writing letters to almost any church in America, and for that matter, any family in America, he would start with men. Why? Why? Do you want to know why the family unit in America is breaking down? The failure of men to lead in a biblical way. Do you want to know why our schools are a mess? The failure of men to lead in a biblical way. Do you want to know why the church in America is becoming largely ineffective? The failure of men to lead in a biblical way. If men would start taking their biblical calling seriously, things would change quickly. If we would stop blaming the school system, if we would stop blaming the media or blaming the Democrats for all of our problems, and instead man up, take the word of God seriously, and take a long, hard look in the mirror we would see the answer to most of our problems. So God starts with men. Paul starts with men. This was the problem then, it's the problem now. There's not, nothing worse than a bunch of men who complain about everything, but don't ever do anything. So our children, our teens, our children face an identity crisis today. I wonder why. It's not the media. It's not the school system. I'm not scared to send my kids to public school. You know why? Because I know what my calling is. I know who I'm responsible for as the man in my house. It's not the teacher's fault. It's on me. I look in the mirror, men. You're the leaders. It's time to lead. We leave everything for women to do. They raise our kids. Many times they work jobs outside of the home. They're the spiritual leaders in our house, if we're honest. They're the spiritual leaders in our churches. We leave everything to them. Meanwhile, we might work a job, earn a living, but beyond that, we don't do much, if we're honest. We act like that's a big deal. Please, that's easy. We hunt, we fish, we watch sports. We collect guns to protect our families we don't want to lead. That's easy. Paul starts with men. That's where I'm starting. We do the man stuff, but we don't do the man stuff. We leave all the heavy lifting to our women to do everything. And you can tell, I could probably spend a lot of time talking to men. And I will. Today, we're going to vote, fo focus primarily on three, four, and five. We're going to zero in on that. So this is also what accords with Scripture. Paul says that older women should behave in a certain way. They should be reverent in behavior. They should not be slanderers and not slaves to much wine. Not to be reverent in behavior means they should hold 
to the good, to the noble, the honorable, the authoritative things in high regard and esteem. Now, why is that important? Well, what happens when a lady, a woman, has contempt for her husband? What happens? What does that do for, to her children and to the other girls she has influence over? They won't respect him. Over time, they'll develop contempt for him as well. What happens when a lady has contempt for her pastor? That's uncomfortable for me to say, but there is some authority spiritually here. What happens when a woman has contempt for her pastor? What's that do to her children or the other women or people in the church? It poisons the well. What happens when a lady disrespects teachers, principals, people that have authority over our children, just men in general? Like, I, I get it. Men are bad, and some of us have a, a bad taste in our mouth. But when we slander men in general, it's, we're adding to a, a decades, centuries-long problem. So Paul says they should be reverent. And that leads to the second thing he says. If you're reverent, you're not slandering people. Now, what is the definition of slander? It literally means to say something that will hurt another person or damage their reputation. Now, understand me. There's times... When the truth needs to be told about a person. The Bible actually teaches that. As Christians, we are to be truthful people and bold people. But slander is when you're saying something with the intent to defame someone or to stir the pot because you like drama. Have you ever met someone like that? Yeah. All of their life is drama. It's one world-changing, earth-shattering event after another. I don't know about you, but that is exhausting. So Paul says, you older women, be reverent, don't slander others, and don't be a slave to wine. That last one should be a given, right? Alcohol thins your filter. It loosens your lips. It disintegrates self-control. Basically, don't get drunk. You get drunk, you do stupid things. You say stupid things, you act in stupid ways, and eventually you'll wake up morning, one morning with a lot of regrets. Then Paul goes on in verse 3 and says, And by being reverent, by not being slanderous, and by not getting drunk, here's what you'll end up doing. You'll train the young women to love their husbands and children. Now Ephesians 5 tells us that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loves the church. And here in Titus that we find that wives are also, also supposed to love their husbands and their children. Bear with me. All right. And it's very interesting to me what Paul is saying here. In verse 2, the word love is agape. Here in verse 4, the word love is philia. Now, you'll hear people say agape is unconditional love. And philia is brotherly love, and that's true for both of these. But that's the short, concise dictionary definition. Let me go into a little more detail here. Philia is a strong, and I mean strong, bond between people who share common values, interests, and basically life together. The Greek word is not only describing brotherly love, but soldierly love. So when it says a, a woman is to love her husband... This way, it means as a soldier together in the battle. This kind of love says, I want the very best for every person. I will even die for them. It includes respect and self-sacrifice. A great example of this in the Bible is David and Jonathan. So wives are called to be both agape love and philia love for their husbands. And when this kind of love is missing in the home, nothing else can fill the gap that a husband fills. Nothing else. His career won't satisfy him. Expensive homes, cars, boats, or even guns won't satisfy him. Now think about this principle with me for a second. If you're being reverent, if you're not slandering others, and if you're not putting down a bottle of wine every night, and that's helping to teach women 
to love their husbands and children, then what's being taught if you're not reverent, if you are slanderous, and you get hammered on a weekly basis? It's teaching women not love for, for their husbands and their children. And if you look at, you go on to verse 5, Paul, Paul goes on and he says, it also teaches younger women to be self-controlled, to be pure, to work at home, to be kind, and to be submissive to their own husbands. All of those things are things that are born out of love for another one, right? All of those things are, are born out of love. And ladies, make sure you get this. Paul says, submissive to their own husbands. He's not saying you submit to every man in general. That's not what he's saying. He says you have a husband and you willingly and lovingly submit to his own authority. And of course, there's qualifiers to that as well. God is our supreme authority, and we submit to other authorities and leadership as they are faithful to him. Now being self-controlled, pure, and kind are all things that our Christians are called to. So to be self-controlled means you're in control, not your sin nature. You're putting to death your sin nature and its desires. Purity goes along with that. To be pure means you're keeping yourself away from the outside things that are going to spoil you or dirty you or corrupt you, whether that's influences, whether that's relationships. Hear me. If relationships cause you not to be pure in mind or in body, you need to cut that out. You're keeping yourself away from the outside things that are going to spoil you or dirty you or corrupt you. That's things you watch, that's things you listen to, and that's things you read. And to be kind is to be nice to other people. That's pretty simple, right? To be friendly to other people and to bless other people. And again, these are things all Christians are called to do. But Paul is specifically saying that young moms need to be taught these things because they will aid in their roles as young women and as wives and as mothers. But then he throws in something else. He says, teach them to work at home. And this is where we're about to get controversial. So first of all, Paul is not saying that women could not work outside the home. That's not what he's saying here. But at the same time, what is being implied here and what's taught throughout all of Scripture is that the wife is the keeper of the home. You go all the way back to the foundations in Genesis, and God himself says that man is to make the living by the sweat of his brow. Man is to work to make the living. And because of Adam's sin in the garden, there is a curse upon labor. Now understand me, work is a good thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's something God has ordained. But it's also toilsome, stressful, and troubling at times. It's that way because of the curse that came about due to Adam's sin in the beginning. A lot of times I think, like, I, I work with women. I've hired women. I've worked for women. And they're, a lot of times they're so much better. They, they work so much harder. They follow directions. They care. So many times I see that curse. Men are lazy. Not always. I'm, not, I'm a man. I mean, I'm, this isn't always, but I've worked with a lot of women. They present their own challenges, but hard work is not one of them. Oh, I lost my spot. <laughs> All right, Barry. Uh, when a woman, a lady, a wife goes to work outside the home, she's taking upon herself the curse of the man. And the thing is, Eve and women in general had a curse they already had to deal with. Pain in childbirth, not all of us have experienced that, and a desire to be over men. Most of you have experienced that. And what the radical feminist movement has tried to do is to subvert the decrees of God by saying, 
We're not going to have babies, so we'll avoid the pain of childbirth. We're not, we are going to go instead and take on the role of men so that we can be over them. No one says it like that, but that's what we're saying. And they think that they will escape the curse that women have to deal with by taking on the curse that men have to deal with. But what they end up doing is having to deal with both of them at the same time. Now again, please hear me. I'm not saying women can't or shouldn't work outside the home. But what I'm saying, ladies, is that when you do that, make sure it's for the right reason. And when you do that, understand you're not only going to have to deal with the curse that women face, but also that the, men, the curse that men face. So don't, here's what I'm saying. This is the essence of it. Don't believe the lie that being at home or keeping a home and raising children is somehow demeaning or degrading to you. And don't believe that it's not actual work. Uh, time to be honest. There were times when I was working where I, oh, I hate to, I shouldn't do this, but uh, I would work long days, so I'd leave at, before the kids were up, and it'd be time to go home, and I'd be lying if I didn't say sometimes there's a reason I found to stay a little longer. I knew it was bath time. I knew what Amy was do, dealing with. I got guilty. So don't believe the lie that you're not doing enough, women. It's like the story of the stay-at-home mom who m met a career businesswoman at their kid's school function. The businesswoman asked the mom, the stay-at-home mom, what she did, and the stay-at-home mom said, I'm a stay-at-home mom. The businesswoman sneered a little bit and said, oh, so you don't work. <laughs> to which the mom thought, oh, I certainly do. I cook three meals a day. I do dishes. I do this and this and this and this. Plus, unfortunately, I take care of my husband, who for some reason can't take care of himself. It's a full-time job. And then, frankly, I don't see how many of you women do it. You work 40, 50, 60 hours a week, and you manage a home, and some of you do it so, so well. And, and I'm blown away because I know I couldn't do it. Now, at the end of our text here, Paul says that the older women should teach younger women these principles, keeping in mind that by doing this, it makes it so the word of God isn't reviled. I'm sure you've all heard the saying, you might be the only Bible people ever read. They say in the United States that just about every home has a Bible, and on average, there's three Bibles per home. But that doesn't mean people are reading them. For some people, they bought it 10 years ago. They looked at it once, haven't opened it since. For some people, it was given as a gift. We thumbed through it, but it's collected dust. But what happens when we Christians begin living out our faith in front of the world and living out God's obedience in front of the world, our obedience to God's word? The world takes notice. Some will scoff, but some won't. Some might say, something looks different in your marriage. Something's different about your kids. Something's different about your day-to-day -day life, about your attitude, about you. And moms are like, they're like a billboard that God is using to display his glory, his grace, and his love. And what happens when, ladies, is that you, when you constantly live out your faith, it tells the world that there is a God who is upholding you because we see all that you do and we can't imagine how. This is your opportunity to say, I have Jesus. He is the one that gets me through. You don't see my tears at night, but he does. You just see me putting my head down to the grindstone and getting it done. As you show love, it tells the world within you that God, it is a God who also loves. As you sow wisdom and grace, it shows the world that within you is a God who is full of wisdom and grace. As you give, it shows the world that within you is a God who gave himself, who took our sin and our punishment 
and by giving his very life. Loving moms point to a loving God. And like I said, it is a very high calling. Because of that, you are deserving of our gratitude, our honor, and our love today. And I'm closing. Today I'm going to do something you probably wouldn't expect on Mother's Day. You might expect it if you know me. Today I'm going to call you to repentance. I know that's not common. But I want you to know today is the perfect day to get right with the Lord. Mother's Day 2022 is the perfect day to get right with the Lord. And the first people I want to talk to today are those of you who have mothers alive. So this group of kids right here in the back, I'm 40, I have a mother who's alive. Many of you have mothers who are alive. If you haven't honored your mother in a way that you should have, today is the day to repent. If you've taken her for granted, today is the day to get right with your mom and get right with the Lord. Don't wait. Ladies, if you've been a slanderous and not reverent, then today is the day to repent. If you've lived under the curse of desiring to rule over your husbands, then today is the day to repent. Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Men, you are the pastors to your family. Just like I'm the pastor to this church. You will answer for how well you pastor your family. To love your wife as Christ loves the church is to love her sacrificially. To say I'll take a bullet for my wife is nothing. To die for her is nothing, but to live for her is everything. To simply earn a living is not what it means to be a man. You are responsible for your family. You will answer for the way you love your wife. If you want to honor mothers, if you want to honor women, be a man. If you would like to repent men, be a leader, spend some time on your knees, take the word of God seriously. Today is the day. The world is desperate for the love, for the word of Jesus Christ. It's time for men here in New Life Church and in the Lake community to get serious about this. I want to invite anyone who would like to pray at the altars. If anyone would like to repent, today is the day. If you want to honor your mother, if you want to honor the Lord, today is the day. There is no shame in repentance. There is only freedom in repentance. If you would like to pray for your mother, today is a great day to do that. If you would like to pray as a family, the altars are open. Let's pray together. Father, uh, we don't deserve your grace and your mercy, Lord. But we're grateful for it. We are grateful for the blessing that is the women in our lives. Our mothers, our wives, our sisters, our daughters and granddaughters. Today we celebrate those women, those gifts, that glue that holds it all together, Lord. We would be lost without them. For so many of us, they've been our greatest blessing. Father, today, 
I pray that you convict our hearts to live up to the calling that you've called us to. Father, I'm asking you to send your Holy Spirit to give us the power to do this because we can't do it on our own. We love you so much. Thank you, Lord, for the mothers, for the women that have influenced us. Help us to love them well. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, let's pray and then we'll dismiss you. Father, thank you for the work you've done here today, Lord. Thank you for the work you've done in my life, Lord. I pray for all of us as we leave here, Lord, that we might rep represent you well. Teach us how to pray, Lord. Yes. Teach us how to love our neighbor well. Teach us how to honor the women in our lives. You are so awesome. Yes, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ladies, there's a gift on your way out. Becky Johnson's out there. Uh, there's also a photo booth here. Get a family photo. Women, go eat carbs, take a nap, do what you're going to do. So.